afternoon for a conversation about student debt. Uh, this uh, panel is called Don't Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste, Big Ideas Around the Student Debt Crisis. And I'm thrilled to have a number of incredible colleagues uh, with me this afternoon to dive deeper into this conversation. So let me um, turn it over to them to give a quick 30 second introduction. Um, your name, your organization, and then I would like you to take your best guess at the current student loan debt uh, that is being held by Americans. So I'm gonna um, turn it first to Greg Scoresby. Greg, would you give a, a quick introduction? Yes, I, I'm Greg Scoresby. I'm the founder and CEO of Campus Logic. We are a, a B2B SaaS company selling our student financial success software to colleges, universities, and they buy our products so that they can make uh, every interaction, every financial interaction with their students mobile and simple and personalized. My best guess, I wasn't quick enough to Google this here, but uh, that's why you didn't give us the question. I'm guessing it's 1.623 trillion. All right. Close. Uh, Tom, why don't I turn it to you? Hi there. I'm Tom Wolf, founder and CEO of EdAid. Um, we enable students from underrepresented communities to get access to the best graduate vocational programs in the UK, US and the least. Uh, my best guess is probably somewhere shy of 1.6 trillion. So let's go for 1.58. Okay, great. Angela, I'll turn it to you. Well, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Angela Ceresny and I'm the CEO of Climb Credit. We're the leading uh, financing and payment uh, provider for high ROI education uh, in the US. Uh, we work with uh, trade and vocational schools that offer uh, career training uh, certifications and degrees, uh, help them grow their business and help people access the education that uh, can actually change your life. Um, I'm gonna go above 1.6. Uh, I forget exactly the number Greg said, but I'll go 1.64. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Michael? Are we playing the price is right rules is the real question. Oh. <laughs> You'll see where this takes us. Um, <laughs> Michael? Hey, this is Mike with Perch. We're a platform that allows you to build credit without having to go into debt or increase your expenses using recurring expenses as trade lines. Um, to answer your question, um, I'm going to go with the average with everyone else and just go at 1.6 and see where that goes. All right. And Daniel. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dan Rogers, the CEO of AM Money. We are a alternative student loan company that's focused on creating responsible student loan products for everyday Americans. And so I'm going to go with 1.7 trillion. All right. Well, everyone is, is quite close. Um, my quick research this morning was 1.64 trillion. So Angela, uh, you are right on the money. And that is debt that is held by a little over 44 million Americans. Um, and the reason that I brought that up is because the student debt crisis has been in the headlines for at least the last two decades, maybe more. Um, and for nearly two decades, the crisis has grown more severe. There are some who believe that a degree of student debt may actually not be a bad thing. And in fact, the student loan debt that is held by an individual may be the best debt that the learner can carry. So I'm curious, do you agree that some debt is a good thing? Why? Why not? Um, I would love to kick us off on this, Great. actually. Um, I think overall debt is naturally a progressive thing, right? Um, if you can't afford something, some future purchase or some good that can progress your life, you go into debt, gives you access and you're able to pay that off. And now your quality of life is naturally improved. If you take this concept and give it to college loans, you're assuming someone gets loans, they go into university, they graduate and now they're good to go. I think the problem here is exactly what you hit on at the beginning. There's $1.6 trillion in student loans right now that's growing at 7%, was supposed to be at 2 trillion by the end of 2021. So naturally it's obvious that these loans are not being paid off. Right now I think it's like 40% of student loans are supposed to be defaulted by 2023. And it's clear that there's a misconception on the end game of student loans where people are graduating university and they're just not paying back their loans. 
Um, this could be a financial education issue. This is a ability to repay issue. Um, it's a lot of things that go into it. So I think to answer the question, if there was a way to prove that these loans can actually be paid off after university, then yeah, it's a great thing. But right now it's not happening. I think that's the issue. Others? Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I agree with everything uh, that you just said. Um, I think that uh, similarly, I've worked in credit my whole career and believe that there are a lot of uh, situations where credit is a really great thing. I think uh, one interesting kind of place to look is at Muhammad Yunus and the work that he did in Bangladesh, uh, where he recognized that actually a lack of credit was what was stopping a lot of people from starting businesses and being able to kind of get out of a cycle of poverty and did so through micro micro credit. So I think, you know, there's a lot of places in history where you can look and see that uh, debt is a good thing. Um, I think that two of the challenges that I see with the, the system of kind of the racking of, of, of large amounts of debt that we see in the US is one, a, um, a lack of incentive alignment, um, particularly between the learner who's actually going into school and the educational uh, institution that's providing that education. The way that the system is set up today is primarily where the educational institution gets most of that money up front. Uh, essentially, when someone sits in, this, in, in their seat, there are some reasons why a school would not want huge default rates uh, at their program. Uh, but for the most part, those aren't financial uh, or, uh, or like clear uh, incentives that are drawn. And what we're seeing with the way CLIMB, we do our loan program, and then also through the kind of admin of ISAs and, and others, is that having the schools participate in some way alongside the students in the loan um, helps to keep uh, the school sort of incentivized to want the loan to get paid off and therefore want it to uh, want to deliver the outcomes right that someone should expect and then the, the other thing is I think that we um, we don't have a lot of outcomes information for people so I think a lot of people make decisions about going to school which in some cases a multi hundred thousand dollar decision without really understanding what the likely outcomes are on the other side because that data is really hard to find. Um, and if you're to do the math, uh, there are some programs or schools where, where the ROI is not there, um, where either graduation rates are really low, so the likelihood of graduating is, 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 is a big risk, um, right. or maybe the jobs you get on the other side aren't gonna support the debt that you're taking. Sure. So then does debt become a bad thing when there's a misalignment between the credential that the student earns and the labor market needs? And if so, how do you hold higher education accountable or have them have higher education be more directly involved in addressing that misalignment? So if I may, um, ultimately, I think the problem with the framing of both questions here is that in some respects, what we're doing is conflating two entirely separate things, right? Because ultimately, like when we start to talk about the conversation of student debt, we are talking about the quality of the, of the institution versus how it's paid for, right? And as a person who, you know, is a finance nerd who like believes in credit, right? Like, I think that conflation can lead us into some wrong directions and some, wrong places as we kind of talk about it because ultimately right like when we look at the cross tabs of who is incapable of paying back student debt who is the most at risk for default who has the most problems associated with that right they do simply overlap with certain things like quality of institutions and ultimately certain things like performance of that student Right. And so it's very important when we talk about things to not lump the entire, you know, 1.6 trillion asset class into all of the things for all of the people. Because ultimately, like in my case, right, I have about left like about 80K in student loan debt, but that bought me an MBA from a top school of business, which was a great investment to make on my part. Right. Ultimately, but what we also have are tons of people who are sold a dream for for-profit institutions, for trade vocations and the like. And that's also where most of the risk is concentrated in the market, right? And so when we're having these conversations, I do think it's very, very important to talk about precisely who it is we're talking about and ultimately what actual incentives are we actually 
talking about, right? Because ultimately, when we say things like, well, schools don't have an incentive to their students, it really depends on who we're talking about, right? Because if we're talking about regional state colleges, which are beholden to state stakeholders and their students in various ways, we don't see the same issues as we see for for-profit institutions who are beholden to investors in an entirely different group of stakeholders. So Greg, I'm going to turn to you because I know a lot of the work that you've been doing is directly with institutions. What has been your experience um, working with institutions, particularly through some of these challenges related to debt and financial education for students? Yeah, we, uh, we have about 750 colleges, universities across the U.S. of, of, of all types and sizes, large, large, uh, large uh, state institutions, private institutions, two-year, four-year, um, almost entirely uh, not-for-profit. But um, the, so, so and, I'm, and I'm long on, my point of view is I'm long on higher education. It's still the best, still the best tool, the best path for social mobility there is. But I think some of the points have made uh, we made here are really important. That um, Angela made a good point about decision making. It's hard for students to make decisions. I'll give you one. Uh, we've done a bunch of research in this area here, and I think schools can um, be be better at this. But let me give you an example. Uh, you know, this has been this this stat has been replicated over and over in multiple studies. The National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators first did a study in 2013 that found that about two thirds of parents and students don't understand the award letter, uh, the award offer that's be being delivered to them. That is the point of purchase. That's when someone signs up for what they're getting ready to borrow. And if you don't understand things like what direct cost and indirect costs are, or something as basic as what is grant aid versus loan, like stuff I've got to pay back or stuff that's free, uh, that's a real problem. So I think institutions uh, have incredible opportunity. I mean, we sell software to colleges and universities. We want to help them get great at helping students make better decisions so they can borrow less, so they can borrow responsibly, so they can get better, you know, more free money uh, to fund their education. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that students and families have the right information at the right time to make the right decisions that uh, are really going to uh, impact the rest of their lives. Absolutely, no, I appreciate that. Tom, what about you? What, um, in terms of you know, thinking about this question of um, you know, debt being a good thing or a bad thing and how, um, how the education program aligns with what the student is actually you know, paying for and then getting in return, what are, what are some of your thoughts? Well, given that we have the remit here of big, bold solutions to big, bold problems, then I think we can be a little bit left field. I think there's probably three elements that, you know, we're not there at Eddie, but we, we definitely want to get to. And, and as we've touched upon here, the sector is so big. I mean, the majority of students studying this September are mature students, vocational learners. They're not all fresh 18 year olds going into freshman year. So there's so many stakeholders we have to talk about. But fundamentally, there's probably three pillars that really excite us and touch upon probably what everyone's doing here and everyone in the world is looking for. And number one for us is about embedded financial services so that universities are able to offer the, the fair, affordable finance to everybody at the point of decision. And that, that, that you demystify a lot of the noise and the, and the misdirection and the obfuscation that comes from the, 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 the range of options out there that are often designed to mislead. And so many students don't understand their Pell options or what, what the most affordable option is. So I think number one is around ensuring that all providers, regardless whether they're an ISA or that they are a traditional lender are regulated and that they, they provide information to students in a consistent manner. I think that's number one and the, the various TILA kind of protections there. Number two is that, you know, we're fundamental believers, a bit like Andrew, that universities have to have a stake and share risk in the outcome with every student. And that actually US news rankings will not be the future indicator of the quality of the course, but actually the direct correlation between the performance of the institution and the outcome mm -hmm. of the students will, will be the leading indicator of whether that course is viable and should be taken. And I think we're, we're, we're big proponents of that shared risk, shared reward model and deferred tuition. And the third is we really need to look at how do we we start to build equitable models that third party stakeholders, the employers, um, the state, the government, and, and quite frankly, consumer led organizations can, can work together to help students pay down debt, either through loyalty programs, through uh, employer contributions. So rather than making it personal about 
headache per se is really looking at number one, how do we drive embedded financial services to ensure fair, affordable access to everybody? Number two is ensuring that institutions share risk and outcomes. And then the third is ensuring that we all collectively use the financial services ecosystem and employer led contributions to, to pay down that debt sooner. Sure. So that actually leads me to thinking about a cohort of students or learners, let's say learners, um, because I think what we're really talking about is lifelong learning. We're not just talking about a population of 18 to 22 year olds. And so when you think about students who are actually in default on prior loans from a previous education experience, they are trying to get back into the ed higher education system. So they're ca already carrying some debt. This clearly presents some significant challenges in how to get them re-enrolled so they can finish either the credential that they started um, or perhaps um, pursue a course of study that's better aligned with what they want to do. What are some of your suggestions, particularly for this population with some college, no degree and uh, already carrying some debt? Let me... Um... I, this is something I, I, I care a whole lot about. I, I think when we talk about student debt here, it's easy to focus on the macro number, which is uh, re really astronomical, like 1.64. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit competitive, so I'm disappointed that Angela beat me on the number here, but, uh, but not really. Uh, you know, the, the problem we want to talk about is not, is not so much debt. I mean, yes, that's a problem, but debt, debt without degree is actually the culprit that that is the real problem here. And so you, when you've got students at colleges, universities dropping out with relatively low dollar balances, I got a $500 balance at the end of fall semester and I can't figure out how to pay that. So because of that, uh, I can't, the bursar's office blocks me from registering for new classes. Uh, so I can't actually get in spring semester and drop out. Sure. It, would be, it would be better for the institution to just like write that off, right? <laughs> like get, you know, like write off that 500 bucks and let's get the student back in, in school and keep them. So I think, I think institutions can be a lot more thoughtful about data to keep students in school in the first place. So because, uh, you know, debt without degree is what is what leads to default. The bulk of students that are in default actually owe less than $10,000, but they have no degree. And mm -hmm. so that's the, that's the problem. It's not the, it's not the uh, it's not the guy that went to University of Chicago with eighty thousand dollars in debt and got this awesome MBA and is wicked smart built you know building a company here. That's not the problem with where. Chicago actually worked with the um, community college system in the city to forgive the existing debt of students who had this very issue, right? Um, to that point of both, right? Like obviously it's a huge hindrance for their ability to go back into school, you know, pursue a, a degree or a credential or the like. And then two, acknowledging that the institution as it's currently constituted, didn't really have the resources necessary to make that choice on their own, right? Because ultimately, we've brought up this point that institutions can do a lot, right? But we're kind of glossing over the fact that oftentimes institutions are required to do so in an environment in which the funding which they've, they have historically relied upon has been drying up. And so as we kind of talk about ideas and how to handle it, that sort of partnership in which a civic entity who has a vested interest in the well-being of these individuals has like stepped up to help solve this problem. And ultimately, I do think more of that is, is going to go a lot further to solving this at scale. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. And I think that um, most institutions want to do the right thing. I, I, I mean, in my experience of talking to schools for many years, it's, it, you don't get a lot of schools who are just like, we don't care. 
you know, but, but there is a resource issue in, across the board, um, particularly in the institutions that are um, working with like, you know, people that are, might be at more risk of dropping out, right? The lower income students, those schools have to sometimes provide more services and, and they don't necessarily have the money. So it's not that they don't wanna have their incentives aligned or they don't want people to graduate, but they don't have the resources to really provide what they need to provide in terms of wraparound services to the students who are attending. And I think, I don't know, like I, I really agree with sort of the original point that Daniel made from the first question that like the 1.64 trillion number is so massive, but also like there's so many micro situations going, like there's so many, it's obviously a problem in itself, but the drivers of that problem are, are really different and really vast and like cover our entire economy, you know, and like all socio levels of socioeconomic and, and all job function, I mean, everywhere, right? And so you have, um, I don't know, I think the solutions need to be different and targeted uh, for the, the different problems within that $1.6 trillion massive problem. Perfect. Well, you actually, Angela, you just took me to my um, my next question, and you know we're what less you know around thirty days out from um, from a, a, an election, um, and we haven't heard too much from either candidate about their broad education agenda. But the one thing that we have heard um, over and over again, I think, by policymakers, is this idea that free college is actually a solution worth considering. And so I, I'm curious, um, your reactions as a, as a panel to this idea of free college, is it really a solution? And if not, um, let's start digging in to some of those you know, cohort issues uh, that we have and, and what are some potential solutions for addressing the, the student debt crisis? I'll, I'll put my neck out as the token right. brick because I, I, I won't comment on US politics because I'm- Let's I'm, not I'm, go there. <laughs> but what I would say certainly is, uh, in my opinion, free college is typically, if you look at the, the stats, is just probably the largest transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich in the United States or the, or the UK if we institute free college, because effectively, you know, those that go to college are typically, so potentially means-tested college where there is extra levels of affordability and grant funding for those that need it the most, but blanket free college is simply just a transfer of wealth from, from the poor to the rich. And the last time I read Robin Hood, it didn't go that way in the book. So um, you know, I think that we should be doing more for Pell students. Um, uh, Professor Frederick from Howard University spoke uh, very much, uh, very eloquently recently on a podcast around the issues of accounts receivable to our last point we just picked up around students from uh, you know, uh, ethnic minorities that sit there. And that's a, you know, a, um, a college which has incredible outcomes for its students, but they have many students who can't graduate because Pell students particularly because they have last mile funding and that's a real problem that we need to solve around the last mile funding and, and we do a lot of it at aid. But I think certainly free college for those that need it the most, absolutely, but but blanket free college is, is effectively a handout um, to, to the middle and wealthier parts of society. So if I can challenge that just a little bit right and like 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 i sit here i know ironically in a shirt from the university of chicago and i think the presumption that like people are going to forgo like private education at institutions like that to take advantage of free college at the public institutions in the city is frankly bullshit right because like ultimately higher education particularly from certain types of institutions in certain places are in high demand and ultimately like when we start talking about things like transfer of wealth right we can't do that in isolation right because ultimately what we're comparing is one world in which people who are higher income are able to go to high quality institutions regardless of the cost and are able able to then take that and uh, like obtain jobs and other things that come along with that and then people who are lower income are increasingly locked out of that entirely to a world in which the rich people can still go to whichever institution they want to pay for and people are not locked out of education right and so ultimately like this notion that it's just going to be a handout for people like I think does not hold even like basic water because ultimately we have to consider where people are coming from and what the current system is currently doing to students. 
Well, so, so just very quickly, I'll come back and I'll be quiet. I think absolutely, I don't think we're misaligned, but what I'd be saying is that, for example, those higher kind of higher caste system education institutions, which effectively haven't increased enrollment for 30 or 40 years, should be made to increase their enrollment for Pell students. They should be made and compelled and that they free funding for students potentially to attend those from low income backgrounds absolutely but it has to be targeted um so both state because otherwise you just exacerbate the gap of, between state versus the, the elite privates so including that and making sure there is great diversity on campus at those institutions and the state funding students to attend those and, and compelling the likes of the very top institutions that if they don't use their endowments for low-income students more effectively they lose the right to be non-profits i think will be a far greater use of government resource i agree with that yeah, I, I'd love to jump in here. I think the issue isn't even on whether or not college should be free. I think it goes back to what Greg said and then Tom said thereafter. It's the micro moments that people have when they're in university. It allows them to either A, not get their degree, or B, when they do get their degree, they're not financially literate enough, or they don't have the right income to pay for the debt that they incurred from college. And now they're, for like the next 20, 25 years, paying 10% of their income to these fees. I think the problem is if you're coming into university um, and you're low income, I mean, naturally the amount of access, education, and just overall knowledge base that you have on university is gonna be much lower than someone who has a higher income, wealthier, and their family's been to USC or U Chicago for the last five years. I think the problem isn't whether or not, you know, we know that there's opportunity, it's whether or not we can actually go through with it. If I could apply for, you, I guess this context on like why I built my startup, is I was $10,000 short of my tuition after getting accepted to USC and I had no idea what to do. First one of my family to go to college, we didn't even know that I was gonna get hit with that. And this was after I got that acceptance letter and you know, things were great, but the next week things were terrible. I think if I knew that there was a process or support system or you know, they're opening up application system to help me finance that way through, then my problem's eliminated. Like it's, there's no problem. And then the kid who's wealthier can pay for university and it's, a, it's like an equal playing field. But I don't think, I think the problem really lies in like situations that even Greg pointed out earlier, uh, going between my sophomore to junior year and uh, just for context, I'm still pretty young, I'm 21. Um, I was $1,200 short on my tuition for junior year because I had lost my key. Um, and also I had to pay for books, which I ended up putting on my card because of my USC card because I couldn't pay for it myself. That actually limited me, just like Greg said, from actually applying to classes the next year. And until I could pay that debt off, I couldn't even sign up for any classes. I ended up paying it off about a week before university started, got into my classes then, and now I'm limited access. I think that's the true problem. It's, it's not whether or not college is free or not. It's the micro moments that a student has that they need success with. Props to the guy launching an innovative uh, company at 21. I love it. Yeah, uh, very impressive. Awesome. <laughs> You know, one, uh, a couple thoughts on this. I, I think we, like the free college conversation, uh, like, like we've said over and over, is way more nuanced than people realize. If you make the right decisions and you're a low income student, uh, college is pretty cheap. Uh, if, you, if you can find, if you can make the right decision. Look, we are, my family is not low income. I have a son going to a community college right now. We paid 1200 bucks for his fall semester. That is freaking cheap. I mean, that is a good deal. And, and he, you, look at, you look at what the total cost of education for him to, to make this decision, like every, you know, go, go, do, go, go do that for a year and a half or so, and then transfer to a, a state institution, it's cheap. And if you're, if you're a Pell recipient, you can manage that for free. Now, now I, I get that that's, that's just part of the conversation. That's one segment. That doesn't mean everybody gets to go to University of Chicago or Harvard or Stanford, you know, for, for free. But I think there, there are aspects that a lot of families aren't even aware of or don't realize that, that these options are, are available to them. The, the second point, though, is um, this is the taxpayer in me. This isn't the CEO of a software company uh, speaking here. I think it's reasonable when you have non-market driven um, uh, features, like a Pell Grant is a subsidy. It is a subsidy to higher education. A subsidized loan, uh, a subsidized Stafford loan here is a non, it's a non-market based loan. It's a need based loan. It's a subsidy to, to higher education. I think it's reasonable to expect like some uh, for lack of a better word, and this won't might not be popular, but some price controls 
in certain situations if you've got subsidies. You see this in a number of other industries that receive subsidies that, that there are effective price controls. So that might not be really popular to say, but if you're gonna give more subsidies to higher education, you're not gonna see asset prices of anything magically go down because you've given more subsidies. Like you see this in every market, more subsidies lift the, the price. So you have to have a way to, to create, if you're gonna give more subsidies, which I'm actually for, you know, let's, let's double the amount of Pell Grants in this country. But I think you gotta find a way, you can't let that translate into like a linear growth in tuition prices and effectively have people borrow more and more. Well, so and the, the other thing to add to that is, is the fixed units, right? So you have essentially unlimited money and the schools have like the, the school sizes aren't growing, right? So like it, it, it is a re right now, the way the system is set up is a recipe for what we're seeing, which is the massive price increases, right? Like it, the schools we keep naming, you know, I went to University of Michigan, so I'll put them on the list too. Um, uh, I was in state, which was good. <laughs> um, but uh, in any case, like I, the, I look at how much it costs to go there. I went there in, the, in 2000. I look at the, at the cost that, that, it, that it would be now, even for in state, and it's like, it's at least double, if not two and a half. And, and that's because they're not taking more people either. Right, and so you have like a really, a, a really funky recipe for uh, for a lot of bad things happen. And I, so I don't know about free college. I I don't I I kind of agree with everyone's point of view on that. But I do think we need to change something. Like we can't. That might not be the answer, but it's it's got to be something else because otherwise, it, the 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 system we have is going to keep going in the direction it's going. So let me raise an idea, um, and I know there are, you know, I think 10 different sessions um, over the course of this meeting that touch on innovative finance in some way. And there is a trend um, around, and, and some of you have even mentioned it um, here today, this notion of a, an income share agreement. Um, uh, you know, I'm curious to get the reaction um, from those of you on this panel about ISAs, their future, particularly in a weaker economic environment where fewer jobs um, sort of might weaken the ISA economics for um, those who are actually issuing those contracts. Yeah, so I guess I can wait out here and say absolutely not. Um, so like, and like a part of it is that I do think I have to reject the premise a little bit that like the current systems that we have in some form or fashion are functioning as they are intended, particularly for low income students. And Michael, I apologize in advance, you know, like I hate to make this a competition of sorts, but like you've heard this story from me before is that when I was 21, um, I was actually a sergeant in the US Army deployed to Iraq, taking online courses in between missions, right? And that's how I spent my sophomore year of college. And certainly I made it through and, and was able to get to certain institutions, but I also graduated from college at 25 years old um and like the opportunity cost associated with doing so was massive right and so when we start to talk about you know instruments like income share agreements right like what we're implicitly doing is forcing people to take a product which can capitalize on their upside simply because of the circumstances that we've put them into and ultimately like i would argue right that like the choice to do so is a choice that we make on multiple institutional levels, right? Because like, like I don't take it as like a fact that free college is not a good idea. In fact, like I would argue it's the most sensible idea that we have because we pay for it one way or another, right? Like if we would like to talk about like the brass tax of the situation, when I was in the military, you know, I made about $15,000 per year, right? On the day I graduated from college at 25, I was making 85, thousand a year at the US State Department, right? It's very easy to calculate the associated income tax, property taxes that came from my home and ultimately like the other things which society did not have to pay for from like my healthcare to like, you know, social support services if I would have had to drop out of college like like because of money and then also the fact that like I could have started a company like Michael at 21 versus 35. Right. And so ultimately we have to incorporate all these things and we have to really think about like, what are the implications of what we're saying? And we talk about ISAs, right? Is that we're saying the onus is purely on the individual 
right, to overcome their circumstances, and we're going to charge them more for doing so, right? I don't agree with that. I don't agree with the premise. And ultimately, I think doing so, like, will have large second order effects, like, not just on the individuals, but us as a society. Other reactions, because I, I, I might, as even as the moderator, just push back a little bit on the notion that the, the student is then carrying all that risk. I would say in the current environment, um, particularly in the loan program, the student is bearing a significant, a significant amount of the risk. So I'd be, I'd be interested to tease that out a little bit further with, with the panel. I mean, it really, um, Alice, just jump in. You know, we've been in this space for about five years. Um, we're we're pro income contingent payment. The UK system is built on income contingent payment. We're perhaps and to, to Daniel's point, the problem is that there is no ISA construct. There's no legal construct for it. There's no consumer protection. Or there's very little consumer protection. And so what you get is some very good actors in the space that are trying to be progressive. They're trying to offer effectively 1x ISA. So you never make, you never pay more than a student who can pay up front. Um, it's income contingent. There's a hurdle. So there are some good progressive elements of income contingent payment. Unfortunately, there are those that seek to exploit it. And if, if on one side you're saying to a student, we've got this really great offer and it's not debt and it's free and there's using misleading language, then a lot of students from low income backgrounds are gonna be attracted to a product where they're being misdirected and obfuscated into a product. At the same time, you've got the person that's funded that offering investors 18 to 20% net returns to fund a student's future. So clearly the average student is not going to be blown away by the bullshit and actually look between the lines and say, hold on, if they're getting 18, 20% and you're offering me a free product, somebody is paying somewhere in the middle. So I believe I'm long on income contingent payment, a hurdle so that students who don't get an outcome don't pay for their product. Um, but we need to make sure that the school really is on the hook and it's not effectively a hedge fund that's just running that money up front and the school doesn't really have. And that's an argument that school will go out of business, but that's a lagging indicator. That's five, seven, eight, ten 10 years down the line. Really, if the school holds that risk, we have a much tighter feedback loop. So big on the concept, but the, the delivery at the moment um, needs a little bit more oversight and, and a broader application to really test to see if it's a positive force for good. Details matter, for sure. Well said, said I, I, I'm not in the income share agreement business. So I, I think uh, both Dan and Tom made really good points on, on that. And, but I, what I don't love about, about income share agreements are when the use case is, hey, we're gonna give you this uh, subsidized loan you're going to get an unsubsidized loan. You're going to get a private loan on top of that. And then there's still a bit of a gap. So let's load you up with an ISA, right? Like when you start stacking stuff up, it, it's a financial obligation. We shouldn't talk about it like it's not a financial obligation. But if you, but the, the concept of like what Tom's talking about, where like it's 1x and the max payment, and it allows people to line up uh, the value that they get for their education with over a long period of time with which is in the form of income you know i think that uh makes a lot of sense i just don't love the i don't love this tool which i see being used more and more like to for gap funding to load people up with yet an, another financial obligation it's just not in my opinion it's not it's not right and it's not it's actually not going to provide uh, i'm a school guy here and i will tell you that is a brand crusher because when a student graduates from school they like it's it's going to be detrimental to the long-term brand equity of institution if they've got all these financial obligations and so i just think it's short-term thinking if 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 that's the approach that someone takes to um, income share agreements so details matter there's an opportunity for a cohort approach less a a, a full-scale solution um, and there's definitely some details that need to be worked out with regard to who bears the risk um, on that obligation. So we have just a couple minutes left. Well, and can I add one more thing? Yes, I think please. also how it's marketed. Like Fair. one of the issues with ISAs is given that they, were, they are essentially un, um, unregulated is that you can market them however you want. Yeah. And things like the percentage of income over an extended period of time is marketed as a benefit to the student. You know, like, oh, you'll never pay more than some percentage, so it'll be affordable. But really, that's that's actually a tool to generate returns, that percentage of income. 
And in a world of regulation, you would have to say that. And we don't have to right now. So I do think, I do think that it will only, I, I agree with what Tom's Tom and I have talked about, I say it a lot, but <laughs> so I knew I would agree with whatever he said. Um, but uh, I agree with that. I think income contingent, downside protection, all that's important, but people should know what they're paying for that. Like what is the cost to them of that? And it needs to be clearly marketed and can't be positioned incorrectly. So let me wrap up by saying, I know of two different uh, uh, initiatives here in the States that are exploring um, innovative and talent finance related topics. Uh, the US Chamber of Commerce just announced their new talent finance initiative and then Jobs for the Future has their Financing the Future initiative. So as we continue to wrestle with these issues of student debt and even new approaches to financing and perhaps even reformed policy solutions, I think that there are some organizations that are leading some of those discussions, um, particularly from that policy frame and policy angle. And so would encourage a uh, dialogue like this to continue to emerge in those forums. This has been a great conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Be well.